Hi everyone, this short video is just supposed to explain why economists believe that increases in labor productivity are the factor that ultimately drive the increase in the standard of living over time. Now remember, economists are going to measure um, uh, the standard of living using real GDP per capita, which is over here on the left hand side, so this is our measure of the standard of living. And remember, embrace basically the reason why we call it the standard of living, because it tells you how much stuff the average person can buy. And if you assume people are rational, they're going to go out and buy, you know, food if they're hungry, clothing if they're cold, uh, shelter if that's what they need, health care if that's what they need, etc. So roughly speaking, real GDP per capita is going to be a measure of the standard of living. Now you can break that up, as I've done here on the right, high, right hand side of this equation, um, into three things. And this is really just an accounting identity. I mean, it has to hold. There's just no way around it. Where you have labor productivity, or excuse me, of real GDP on to the top divided by the number of hours worked in the economy. And that's our measure of labor productivity. So that's output per worker hour, or real GDP per worker hour. Over here, the other two variables combined are the labor input. So you have the number of hours each worker works a year, and you have the number of workers in the population. So you can increase your labor input one of two ways. You can either have more people work, have fewer retirees, lower the working age, that type of thing, or you can have those people who do choose to work just work more hours over here. Okay, now the key point, the first key point is going to be why labor productivity must be the um, cause of increases in the standard of living in the long run. And it has to do with the nature of the labor input. Now if you think over here, let's just th think in terms of workers in the population. There is a literally a maximum on that number. It can't go beyond one, right? So you can't get beyond the point where every man, woman, and child, newborn, infant, etc. is working. And if you are at that point, then workers in the population are one, meaning workers are exactly the same size as the population, so the ratio reduces to one. Okay. Now, in reality, it's going to be much lower than that because, and especially in rich countries, people, a lot of um, uh, children don't really start working until after college, so you know, the first 22 years in their life, they're spent in education, so they're not really working apart from summer jobs. In addition, people retire at age 65 or 70, or they retire early at 60 or whatever it is. So you're going to have a pool of people who are too young to work, people too old. You might have people who are too sick to work for various reasons. Or you might have people who simply voluntarily choose not to work so they can stay home, take care of the kids, or do whatever. So in principle, the number of work or the ratio of workers to the population is going to be far below one in most countries. The other component of um, hours or of, la of the labor input is going to be hours worked. So how many hours per year does the typical worker work? Now that's limited to 8,760. Literally if you worked 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, you can't work more than 8,760 hours in a year. Okay, So there's an a upper limit to the number of hours worked as well. Now you have to, in, in addition to that, you've got to sleep, you have to have time eating, there's time for leisure activity, travel to and from work, etc. So in practice, the number of hours worked is far below um, 8,760. In most of um, Western Europe, in the United States, and even Japan today, that number is below 2,000, and sometimes as low as 15 or 1,600 hours um, a year. Uh, the typical worker works. So the amount of hours worked there's per worker, there's a firm upper limit of 8,760, and in practice in most countries, it's far below that. In fact, a country that where workers work a lot, you're going to see 21, 2,200 hours a year they spend working, and that's if they're working a lot. Okay. So now if you think about this, what this says is there's a firm limit on how high labor input could go. The highest this in, um, uh, the, the workers as a share of the population can go is one, and the highest the value of hours per worker can go is 8,760. So there's a limit to how much the labor input can contribute to increases in the standard of living. That means if there's increases in the standard of living perpetually over time, like there have been for the last couple hundred years, the only way that can be happening is if labor productivity is growing. That's why um, economists tend to focus on labor productivity as the key to increases in the standard of living because you can get temporary boosts in the standard of living by having more people work or by having workers work more hours 
Um, but I, or I should say you can have temporary increases in real GDP per capita by having more people work and having um, each worker work more hours. But eventually you reach the upper bound of how much that can contribute to increases in the standard of living. And the only thing left that can drive increases in standard of living is increases in labor productivity. Therefore, when economists try to explain what drives the standard of living over time, we build models for labor productivity. Okay? And there's going to be basically four things, or roughly three or four things that you can think of that we think are going to drive labor productivity, and that's what our model is going to be designed to look at. There's going to be the capital labor ratio, how many hour or how many capital goods does each worker have. There's going to be human capital, what's the skill level of the labor force. You're going to have so, for example, how much education does the typical worker have? How, how good is that education? Those types of things. Are the students actually learning in their classes? You're going to have technological change. So new technologies come along, the computer revolution, you know, you go back a little bit further in time, the development of electricity in the late 1800s and its development in, in the uh, 1900s, et cetera. So those major technological changes, and there are also some organizational changes. Organizational changes. And these things are like the rule of law. Um, the division of labor, things of that nature that affect how productive workers are. So just the what are the quality of the government institutions is another way to think about it. The government and social institutions in organizing economic activity in a country. So these are going to be the things that essentially drive labor productivity. So in the model we build for labor productivity coming up next, we're going to focus on these things. In particular, we're going to focus on the capital labor ratio. Okay, as a determinant of labor productivity. And then we'll throw all these, uh, well, actually, I'll throw technological change and these organizational changes in another category. It turns out the capital labor ratio and human capital are going to be limited how much they can drive labor productivity due to something called diminishing marginal returns. So ultimately, it's going to be things like technological change which drive labor productivity, which means ultimately it's going to be technological change that's driving increases in the standard of living over time. So this is, uh, concludes this short little video. So just to recap, because there's actually some important information here. You can think of, if you want to measure the standard of living using real GDP per capita, then that breaks down into this accounting identity on the right-hand side, which simply has to be true given the definition of the terms, because if you do all the co um, cancellations, you're left with real GDP over the population, because the hours cancel and the workers cancel, um, and you're left with GDP over the population. So you can think of uh, real GDP per capita is driven by two things, labor input and labor productivity. There's a limit to how much labor um, input can drive increases in real GDP per capita, which means the only way real GDP per capita can increase in the long run is if labor productivity increases. Now, what drives labor productivity? That's going to be the focus in um, some of the later videos. But for right now, we can say it's the amount of capital goods each worker has, the amount of human capital each worker has, so the skill level of the labor force. These two are subject to diminishing marginal returns. And then there's also technological change and organizational changes, which might not be limited to diminishing marginal returns. And as a result, ultimately, the things that are going to drive labor productivity and therefore the standard of living in the long run are going to be things like technological change. All right, that ends this uh, video on just uh, what drives the standard of living.